the phenomena of sexual periodicity part two section two of studies in the psychology of sex volume one by havelock ellis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by christopher most the phenomena of sexual periodicity part two section two it is now possible to turn to an investigation which, although of very limited extent, serves to place the question of a male menstrual cycle for the first time on a sound basis. If there is such a cycle analogous to menstruation in women, it must be a recurring period of nervous erethism, and it must be demonstrably accompanied by greater sexual activity. In the American Journal of Psychology for 1888, Mr. Julius Nelson, afterward Professor of Biology at the Rutgers College of Agriculture in New Brunswick, published a study of dreams in which he recorded the results of detailed observations of his dreams, and also of seminal emissions during sleep, by him termed Ganekbali, or Ekbali, during a period of something over two years. Mr. Nelson found that both dreams and Ekbalis fell into a physiological cycle of twenty-eight days. The climax of maximum dreaming, as determined by the number of words in the dream record, and the climax of maximum ecbole fell at the same point of the cycle, the ecbolic climax being more distinctly marked than the dream climax. The question of cyclic physiological changes is considerably complicated by our uncertainty regarding the precise length of the cycle we may expect to find. Nelson finds a 28-day cycle satisfactory. Pericost, as we shall see, accepts a strictly lunar cycle of 29 and one-half days. Phileas has argued that both in women and men, many physiological facts fall into a cycle of 23 days, which he calls male, the 28-day cycle being female. Although Fleiss brings forward a number of minutely observed cases, I cannot say that I am yet convinced of the reality of this 23-day cycle. It is somewhat curious, however, that at the same time as Fleiss, although in apparent independence and from a different point of view, another worker also suggested that there is a 23-day physiological cycle. Beard approaches the question from the embryological standpoint, and argues that there is what he terms an ovulation unit of about twenty-three and one-half days, in the interval from the end of one menstruation to the beginning of the next. Two ovulation units make up one critical limit, and the length of pregnancy, according to Beard, is always a multiple of the critical limit. In man, the gestation period amounts to six critical units. These attempts to prove a new physiological cycle deserve careful study and further investigation. The possibility of such a cycle should be borne in mind, but at present we are scarcely entitled to accept it. So far as I am aware, Professor Nelson's very interesting series of observations, which, for the first time, place the question of a menstrual rhythm in men on a sound and workable basis, have not directly led to any further observations. I am, however, in possession of a much more extended series of ecbolic observations completed before Nelson's paper was published, although the results have only been calculated at a comparatively recent date. I now propose to present a summary of these observations and consider how far they confirm Nelson's conclusions. These observations cover no less a period than twelve years, between the ages of seventeen and twenty-nine. The subject, W. K., being a student, and afterward schoolmaster, leading, on the whole, a chaste life. The records were faithfully made throughout the whole of this long period. Here, if anywhere, should be material for the construction of a menstrual rhythm on an ecbolic basis. While the results are in many respects instructive, it can scarcely perhaps be said that they absolutely demonstrate a monthly cycle. When summated in a somewhat similar manner to that adopted by Nelson in his ecbolic observations, it is not difficult to regard the maximum, which is reached on the 19th to 21st days of the summated physiological month, as a real menstrual ecbolic climax, for no other three consecutive days at all approach these in number of ecbolies, while there is a marked depression occurring four days earlier, on the 16th day of the month. If, however, we split up the curve by dividing the period of twelve years into two nearly equal periods, the earlier of about seven years and the latter of about four years, and summate these separately, the two curves do not present any parallel as regards the menstrual cycle. It scarcely seems to me, therefore, that these curves present any convincing evidence in this case of a monthly ecbolic cycle, and therefore I refrain from reproducing them, although they seem to suggest such a cycle. Nor is there any reason to suppose that by adopting a different cycle of thirty days, or of twenty-three days, any more conclusive results would be obtained. It seems, however, 
when we look at these curves more closely, that they are not wholly without significance. If I am justified in concluding that they scarcely demonstrate a monthly cycle, it may certainly be added that they show a rudimentary tendency for the ecboles to fall into a fortnightly rhythm, and a very marked and unmistakable tendency to a weekly rhythm. That fortnightly rhythm is shown in the curve for the earlier period, but is somewhat disguised in the curve for the total period, because the first climax is spread over two days, the seventh and eighth of the month. If we readjust the curve for the total period by presenting the days in pairs, the fortnightly tendency is more clearly brought out. A more pronounced tendency still is traceable to a weekly rhythm. This is, indeed, the most unquestionable fact brought out by these curves. All the maxima occur on Friday and Saturday, with the minima on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. This very pronounced weekly rhythm will serve to swamp more or less completely any monthly rhythm on a 28-day basis. Although here probably seen in an exaggerated form, it is almost certainly a characteristic of the ecbolic curve generally. I have been told by several young men and women, especially those who work hard during the week, that Saturday, and especially Sunday afternoon, are periods when the thoughts spontaneously go in an erotic direction, and at this time there is a special tendency to masturbation or to spontaneous sexual excitement. It is on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, according to Gary's tables, that the fewest suicides are committed. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, however, with a partial fall on Wednesday, those on which most suicides are committed, so that there would appear to be an antagonism between sexual activity and the desire to throw off life. It also appears, in the reports of the Bavarian factory inspectors, that accidents in factories have a tendency to occur chiefly at the beginning of the week and toward the end rather than in the middle. Even growth, as Fleischmann has shown in the case of children, tends to fall in weekly cycles. It is evident that the nervous system is profoundly affected by the social influence resulting from the weekly cycle. The analysis of this series of ecbolic curves may thus be said to recall the suggestion of Laycock that the menstrual cycle is really made up of four weekly cycles, the periodic unit, according to Laycock, being three and one-half days. I think it would, however, be more correct to say that the menstrual cycle, perhaps originally formed with reference to the influence of the moon on the sexual and social habits of men and other animals, tends to break up by a process of segmentation into fortnightly and weekly cycles. If we are justified in assuming that there is a male menstrual cycle, we must conclude that in such a case as that just analyzed, the weekly rhythm has become so marked as almost entirely to obliterate the larger monthly rhythm. However constituted, there seems to be little doubt that a physiological weekly cycle really exists. This was, indeed, very clearly indicated many years ago by the observations of Edward Smith, who showed that there are weekly rhythms in pulse, respiration, temperature, carbonic acid evolution, urea, and body weight, Sunday being the great day of repair and increase in weight. In an appendix to this volume, I am able to present the results of another long series of observations and nocturnal ecbolic manifestations carried out by Mr. Perry Cost who has elaborately calculated the results, and has convinced himself that on the basis of a strictly lunar month, thus abolishing the disturbing influence of the weekly rhythm, which in his case also appears a real menstrual rhythm may be traced. It does not appear to me, however, even yet, that a final answer to the question whether a menstrual sexual rhythm occurs in men can be decisively given in the affirmative. That such a cycle will be proved in many cases seems to me highly improbable, but before this can be decisively affirmed it is necessary that a much larger number of persons should be induced to carry out on themselves the simple but protracted series of observations that are required. Since the first edition of this volume appeared, numerous series of ecbolic records have reached me from different parts of the world. The most notable of these series comes from a professional man of scientific training, who has for the past six years lived in different parts of India, where the record was kept. Though the record extends over nearly six years, there are two breaks in it, due to a visit in England and to loss of interest. Both involuntary and voluntary discharges are included in the record. The involuntary discharges occur during sleep, usually with an erotic dream in which the subject invariably awaked and frequently made an effort to check the emission. The voluntary discharges in most cases commenced during sleep, or in the half-waking state. Deliberate masturbation, when fully awake, was comparatively rare. The proportion of involuntary to more or less voluntary ecboles was about three to one. A third kind of sexual manifestation of frequency intermediate between the other two forms is also included, in which a high degree of erethism is induced during the half-waking state, culminating in an orgasm in which the power of preventing discharge has been artificially acquired. The subject, E. M., was thirty-two years of age when the record began. He belongs to a healthy family and is himself physically sound, five feet six inches in height, but weight low due to rickets in infancy. In early life he stammered badly. 
His temperament is emotional and self-conscious, while his work is unusually exacting, and he lives for most of the year in a very trying climate. As a boy he was very religious, and has always felt obliged to resist sexual vice to the utmost, though there have been occasional lapses. As regards lunar periodicity, E. M. has summated his results in a curve, after the same manner as Mr. Perry Cost, beginning with the new moon. The periods covered include 54 lunar months, and the total number of discharges is 176. The average frequency is about 3 per month of 28 days. The curve, for the most part, zigzags between a frequency of 4 and 9, but on the 24th day it falls to 1, and then rises uninterruptedly to a height of 11 on the 27th day, falling to 2 on the next day. Whether a really menstrual rhythm is thus indicated, I do not decide to undertake. But I am inclined to agree with E. Hinton himself that there is no definite evidence of it. It looks to me, he writes, as if the only real rhythm, putting aside the annual cycle, will be found to be on the average period between the ecboles, varying in different persons, but in my case, about nine and one-eighth days. May not the ecbolic period in men be compared to the menstrual period in women, and be an example of the greater catabolic activity of men? There is the period of tumescence, and the ecbole constituting the detumescence. The weekend holiday would hasten the detumescence, but about every third weekend there would tend to be a delay to enable the system to get back into its regulation nine or ten days stride. This might possibly be the explanation of the curves. The recent emissions were nearly all involuntary during sleep. Age may have something to do with the change in character. E. M.'s curves frequently show the influence of weekly periodicity, and in the tendency to ecbole on Sunday, or sometimes on Saturday or Monday. In recent years, there has been some tendency for this climax to be thrown towards the middle of the week, but on the whole, Wednesday is the point of lowest frequency. In another case, the subject, A. N., who spent nearly all his life in the state of Indiana, has kept a record of sexual manifestations between the ages of thirty and thirty-four. The data, which cover four years, have not been sent to me in a form which enables the possibility of a monthly curve to be estimated, but A. N., who has himself arranged the data on a lunar monthly basis, considers that a monthly curve is thus revealed. My memoranda, he writes, show that discharges occur most frequently on the first, second, and third days after a new moon. There is also another period on the 14th and 15th, which might indicate a semi-lunar rhythm. The days of minimum discharge are the 7th, 8th, 22nd, and 23rd. It may be added that the yearly average of ecbolic manifestations, varying between 50 and 55, comes out as 52, or exactly one per week. A weekly periodicity is definitely shown by AN's data. Sunday once more stands at the head of the week as regards frequency, in this case very decisively. The figures are as follows. In another case, which has reached me from the United States, the data are slighter but deserve note, as the subject is a trained psychologist, and I quote the case in his own words. Here, it will be seen, there appears to be a tendency for the ecbolic cycle to cover a period of about six weeks. In this case, also, there is a tendency for the climax to occur about Saturday or Sunday. X is thirty-eight years old, unmarried, fair health, pretty good heredity, university trained and engaged in academic pursuits. He thinks he may have completed puberty at about thirteen, though he has no proof that he was in full possession of his sex powers until he was fifteen years, three months old, when he had his first emission. His sex life had been normal. He masturbated somewhat when he slept with other boys or men during early manhood, but not to excess. During the autumn of 1889, when twenty-eight years of age, he observed that at certain times he had an itching feeling about the testicles, that he was slightly irritable, that the penis erected with the slightest provocation, and that this peculiar feeling usually passed away with a nightly emission. Indeed, so regular was the matter that he usually wore a loin garment at these times, to prevent the semen from getting on the bedding. This peculiar feeling ordinarily continued for two or three days. He recalls at these times that he felt like he would like to wrestle with someone, for there seemed to be a muscular tension. These states returned with apparent regularity, and the interval seemed to be about six weeks, though no effort was made to measure the periods until 1893. The following notes are taken from the diaries of X. Thursday, December 29, 1892. The Peculiar Feeling. This is the only entry. Thursday, February 9, 1893. The Peculiar Feeling. The diary notes that X awoke nights to find directions, and that the feeling continued until Sunday night following, when there was an omission. Friday, March 27, 1893. The peculiar feeling. The diary notes that there was an omission the next night, and then that feeling disappeared. Wednesday, May 3, 1893. The peculiar feeling. The diary notes that it continued until Saturday night when X had sexual relations, and then it disappeared. Wednesday, June 14, 1893. The peculiar feeling. 
The diary states that the next night X had an omission, and the disappearance of the feeling. Thursday, July 27, 1893. The Peculiar Feeling. The diary notes that it was apparent at about three o'clock that afternoon. That night at ten o'clock, X had sexual intercourse, and the feeling was not noted the next day. Friday, September 8, 1893. The Peculiar Feeling. Continued until Thursday, the 11th, and then disappeared. No sexual intercourse and no nightly omission. Wednesday, October 25th, 1893, The Peculiar Feeling, continued until Saturday night when there was a nightly omission. Saturday, December 9th, 1893, The Peculiar Feeling, continued until Monday night when there was sexual relations. It will be noted that the intervals observed were of about six weeks' duration, excepting one, that from September to October, when it was nearly seven weeks. These observations were not recorded after 1893. X thinks that in 1894 the intervals were longer, an opinion which is based on the fact that for a period of six months he had no sexual intercourse and no nightly emissions. The times during the six months when he had the peculiar feeling, the sensation was so slight as to be scarcely noted. In 1895 the feeling seemed more pronounced than ever before, and X thinks that it may have recurred as often as once a month. In 1896, 1897, and 1898 the intervals, he thinks, lengthened, at times, he thought, wholly disappeared. During 1899, while they did not recur often, when they did come, the sensation was pronounced, although the omission was less common. There was a particular heavy feeling about the testicles, and a marked tendency toward erection of the penis, especially at night-time, while sleeping. X often awoke to find a tense erection. Moreover, these feelings usually continued for a week. 1. In general, X is of the opinion that as he grows older these intervals lengthen, although this inference is not based on recorded data. 2. He notes that a discharge, through sexual intercourse or in sleep, invariably brings the peculiar feeling to a close for the time being. 3. He notes that sexual intercourse at the time stops it, but when there has been sexual intercourse within a week or ten days of the time, based upon the observations of 1893, that it had no tendency to check the feeling. In another case, that of F.C., an Irish farmer born in Waterford, the data are still more meager, though the periodicity is stated to be very pronounced. He is chaste, steady, with occasional lapses from strict sobriety, healthy and mentally normal, living a regular open-air life, far from the artificial stimuli of towns. The observations refer to a period when he was from twenty to twenty-seven years of age. During this period, nocturnal emissions occurred at regular intervals of exactly a month. They were ushered in by fits of irritability and depression, and usually occurred in dreamless sleep. The discharges were abundant and physically weakening, but they relieved the psychic symptoms, though they occasioned mental distress, since F.C. is scrupulous in a religious sense, and also apprehensive of bad constitutional effects, the result of reading alarmist quack pamphlets. In another case known to me, a young man leading a chaste life experienced crises of sexual excitement every ten to fourteen days, the crisis lasting for several days. Finally, an interesting contribution to this subject, suggested by this study, has been made and published in the Proceedings of the Amsterdam International Congress of Psychology in 1907 by the well-known Amsterdam neurologist and psychologist Dr. L. S. A. M. von Romer under the title translated from German, about the proportion between lunar age and sexuality. Von Romer's data are made up not of nocturnal and voluntary emissions, but of the voluntary acts of sexual intercourse of an unmarried man during a period of four years. Von Romer believes that these, to a much greater extent than those of a married man, would be liable to periodic influence, if such exist. On making a curve of exact lunar length, similarly to Pericost, he finds that there are, every month, two maxima and two minima, in a way that approximately resemble Pericost's curve. The main point in von Roma's results is, however, the correspondence that he finds with the actual lunar phases. The chief maximum occurs at the time of the full moon, and the secondary maximum occurs at the time of a new moon, the minima being at the first and fourth quarters. He hazards no theory in explanation of this coincidence, but insists on the need for further observations. It will be seen that A.N.'s results seem in the main to correspond to von Romer's. End of the Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 2, Section 2